Hey guys, Jared here, and today I'm going to show you the home server that I recently built and how I set it up. It's got 16 CPU cores and 128 gigs of RAM, so it should be able to serve all the things. The motherboard, CPUs, and RAM were all bought secondhand to cut down costs. The rest of the parts were all purchased brand new. Primarily, the server would be running multiple virtual machines at once, so a high core count was important to me. This is why I selected two Intel Xeon E5-2670 CPUs. These go for around 150 Australian dollars each, and have 8 cores and 16 threads. So when combined with a dual socket board, I've got a total of 16 cores and 32 threads. I've seen these CPUs go for as little as 70 US dollars each, so they're definitely worth a look at for a cheap server build. Especially as in recent years there seems to be little performance gain between different Intel CPU generations. The 2670s are based on the Sandy Bridge architecture and came out early in 2012. They're clocked at 2.6GHz and can turbo up to 3.3GHz, and each have 20 megabytes of cache available. Although the CPUs are relatively cheap, keep in mind that a dual socket board may not be, so I suggest checking all pricing before you commit to buy. To keep all these cores cool I've got two Noctua U12DX i4 CPU coolers, which have support for socket 2011, and I've found that they perform quite well. I've done a separate video on them with more details if you're interested. For the board, I'm using an Intel S2600 CP2J. While the board came out in 2012, it's still got the features I need, such as 2 gigabit NICs, SATA 3 support, and of course the most important factor, dual LGA 2011 sockets. There's no support for DDR4 memory, NVMe drives, or newer fancy features, but for my server this will get the job done. The board also has 16 RAM slots, so of course I had to fill all those out with 8 gigabyte sticks for a total of 1 128 gigs of memory. I found 8GB sticks seem to be a pretty good sweet spot for size and price. Once you start looking at 16 gig sticks and higher, the price goes up pretty quickly. And well, 128 gigs of RAM should be more than enough for me anyway. I admit that it'll probably be overkill, but I just had to do it. I was actually looking at buying all of these parts separately on eBay, but then I found that I could buy them together as a bundle for 500 Australian dollars cheaper, so I went with that. I got the bundle from natex.us. I'll leave a link in the description. I also got a 1TB Samsung 8 50 EVO SSD. As my main PC is always low on SSD space, which prevents me from running virtual machines, I figured I'd just get something big with decent performance that should last me for quite a while. I'm running the hypervisor operating system on the same disk as the virtual machines. I did consider buying a smaller, cheaper SSD just to dedicate to the hypervisor, but in the end I decided it wasn't worth the extra cost for my lab environment. If I have any major I.O. issues, I'll revisit that. Speaking of the hypervisor, I still haven't locked down what I'm going to end up using. I've used Zen, Hyper-V, and VMware ESXi in the past, so I've got a bit of experience with how all of those work. At the moment, I'm testing out Windows Hyper-V Server 2016, as it's free. Although the hypervisor operating system is free, you still need to license any Windows virtual machines that you run on top of it. But of course, Windows does have a trial period, so you could keep rebuilding your VMs. I'll probably either stick with this, or the free version of ESXi that VMware have to offer. It'll take me some time to evaluate them in my environment. At the moment, I've only set up some Linux virtual machines that I use regularly, and I've had no problems at all so far. After getting the server set up and configured, basically I just power on the server and connect to it from my Windows desktop with Hyper-V Manager. From there I can create, manage, start and stop virtual machines on the server over the network. The other hypervisors all have similar functionality. For the power supply I went with the Corsair HX850i. The only real requirement here is that the power supply needs to have two EPS connectors, as there are two CPUs to power. So keep that in mind as many desktop power supplies may only have one. I've put all of these parts into a Fantex and Thulux case with tempered glass. As the motherboard is a server board, its size is SSI EEB rather than standard ATX, so I was a little limited in cases that I could use. While it's possible to use an ATX case and drill your own holes, I wanted something that would just work out of the box without any case modding. I could have paid less and got the version with the plastic window, but well, that glass. I've done a full review video of the case if you're interested. Now let's take a look at some benchmarks. I'm only going to be performing CPU based benchmarks here, as I'm not using a dedicated GPU. This is a server and I'm not going to be using it to play games or do any graphical work. I'll mostly be connecting to virtual machines remotely over the network from my desktop, so CPU power was definitely the priority here. I'll throw in a 7700K into the results too, just for scale. In the Cinebench benchmark, the Xeon's got a score of 2030. Pretty nice. In the Passmark CPU benchmark, I got a CPU 
score of 19,622, which was in the 99th percentile of all CPU tests. Not bad for some old Xeons. In Geekbench 4, I got a single core score of 2,627 and a multi core score of 23,742. As expected, the 7700K has much better single core performance, but is of course no match for 16 cores. I let the 7zip benchmark run for 10 passes with a dictionary size of 32 megabytes, which resulted in a score of 58,301 MIPS. I then used Handbrake to encode a 500 megabyte MP4 video file that I recorded from 1080p to 720p. The dual Xeons completed the task, averaging 75 frames per second. Testing was completed with an ambient room temperature of 21 degrees Celsius, and the 16 CPU cores during idle sat anywhere between 29 and 37 degrees Celsius, which makes me wonder if my thermal paste is equally spread out, as that's quite a bit of variance. During benchmarking with all 16 cores maxed out, the core temperatures ranged from 58 to 63 degrees Celsius. Not bad at all, I'm really impressed with the Noctua coolers. Honestly, I could probably throw in a graphics card and just use the server as a desktop PC or workstation, as I'm still using the crappy PC I built in late 2010. The Xeon CPUs outperform my Intel i7-950 CPU with its 12GB of RAM, but I don't know, I like the idea of having a server to keep my workloads separate. I can do something else cooler when I replace the desktop, probably something with a higher clocked CPU with less cores, as I should hopefully have all the cores I need on the server. Something important to note if you're looking at doing a build with the E5-2670 CPUs, is that the SR0KX revision has proper support for Intel VT-D, which is what I have here. If you instead get SR0H8, which is the previous revision, you won't have VT-D support. This is why the SR0H8 ones go for a little cheaper, as they're missing this feature. Now if you don't need VT-D, then you can save some money and get those. Otherwise if you do, you'll need to pay extra and ensure that you get SR0KX. Otherwise if you do, you'll need to pay extra and ensure that you get the SR0KX revision. Overall, I'm pretty happy with how the server build turned out. Despite being limited on case selection, I think that the end result looks pretty nice. I can run multiple virtual machines with plenty of resources assigned to each, and everything works perfectly. No complaints with regards to performance at all. I spent just under 2000 Australian dollars all up, so around 1500 US and about half of that was on the second-hand motherboard, memory, and dual CPU bundle. Comparing it against much more expensive, newer Intel Xeon CPUs makes me think that it was a good deal, but maybe that'll change with the Intel i9 and AMD Threadripper CPU launches coming soon. So what did you guys think about my server build? Be sure to let me know your thoughts down in the comments, and I'd be interested in hearing if you're running any servers at home. Leave a like on the video if you found it useful, or I guess a dislike if you thought the server was a piece of crap made out of mostly second-hand trash. Hopefully not that one. Come on, it's not that bad. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe for future tech videos like this one.